Hello and welcome to Game Brigade. If you are new here, my name is Brian. Thank you for joining me. Today we are going to be talking about the games that I've been the most excited to play or had the most fun or just basically the best games I've been playing within the last few months. I normally do this series every six months or so where uh, I go back and I look at my catalog of uh, played games and I say, man, those games are definitely the ones I loved or I continually want to keep playing. And I want to share that list with you because I always think it's fun to hear what people are really enjoying as of late. As a reminder, we still have our giveaway going on for the three games that I have here. We have the Mythic Mischief, the Moonrakers, and the Fractured Sky. Uh, we'll have details at the end of the video about the entire uh, giveaway, so make sure you stay tuned for that. But without further ado, let's get going. Okay, so for number 10, uh, I don't have all of the games on hand because either they're owned by other people or I play these at conventions. So if I don't have the games in hand, we'll just supply it with a picture. But the first one will be Tyrants of the Underdark. This is a Dungeons and Dragons branded game, uh, but this is a deck building game with an area control element. I just recently played this game and I was surprised at how good this game is by mixing two elements of the area control and the deck building portions of it. Like a standard deck builder, you're gonna have a base uh, set of about 10 cards with several of them being uh, purchasing cards, other ones being combat influencing cards. And then there's gonna be a row of cards that you're gonna be purchasing from, adding to your deck that have more uh, important abilities or things to interact with. What makes this game unique is there is a board in the center of the game with different types of connection points and areas that you are going to be uh, contesting over with your opponents. These will allow you to get victory points uh, in the game, allowing you to get additional purchasing powers on your buy phases, and it really incentivizes uh, players to have interaction with each other as you're buying cards from the row and you're digging deeper into the area control elements. I very much really appreciated it. The other factor that's really cool about this game is the game comes with a, a base load of uh, four decks, or at least the original one did, and there were several expansions, which eventually opens it up to six decks. These decks are what you're going to combine to make the uh, playable uh, buy phase of the rows, you know, what's going to be available for the purchase. So there are different versions of different decks that have different kind of uh, mechanics or uh, themes to them. You take two of them, you shuffle those together, and that's what's going to be your row. So you can get a unique experience through the combinations of the different types of uh, decks. So I think that's pretty sweet. Had a lot of fun with it. And, uh, you know, deck building is one of my favorite mechanics as it is. I love looking for combinations and figuring out different ways that you can utilize and make your, your, your deck um, pretty efficient. And then combining that with the ability to actually interact with my opponents through some str uh, strategy and use of the area control, I thought that was a fun little thing to do. Does this have long-term legs for me? Mm, probably not. It's not, it's not their one that I'm going to be hunting down, especially since it's in the collection of the Game Brigade Studios family. But it's definitely one that I would love to play again and try out more combinations and more decks in the future. Okay, so the next one is another game that I don't have uh, personally. Um, but this is one we played several games of, and I thought I wouldn't like it because of the, format, the formula of this game, the way this game is played uh, is a Polyonimo-like game. I don't normally like Polyonimo games, uh, but it's Foundations of Rome. Foundations of Rome was a game that was on my two-play list last year when we were going down to Dice Tower West. Never got a chance to play it, and I didn't have much incentivization to you know, seek it out because it's Polyonimo, and I never really have found myself loving those types of games. But we went into Foundations of Rome. I was pleasantly impressed with how easy it is to pick up and learn and the enjoyment level, especially seeing the city of Rome kind of, and you know, be, like become a thing. Uh, we did see the new prototype of the Met Metropolitan or Metropolis, which is kind of like the light version of Foundations of Rome, which is kind of like their retail outlet. And I wasn't as impressed visually with that one and I didn't have any incentivization to play that. But at Foundations of Rome, being able to uh, build up these buildings and it looks really cool, it was fun to play. I also really liked the way the mechanics played out with uh, you know the bidding or the stealing, which is a, a module, I believe. Uh, it's not part of the base game, but I had a good time with it and I would uh, definitely play that game again, especially with how easy it is to set up and play 
and get going to the table. So definitely very, uh, a good game. Very light though. So be aware of that. It's a very light game. Okay. So for the games that I actually have in my collection, we'll be we starting with the first one. This is Deadly Dowagers. And this is from Tabletop Tycoon. Uh, and this is one that I actually did a giveaway for this one a couple months ago. And I convinced my gaming group, you know, mostly a bunch of guys, to say, guys, let's try this game because I've heard great things about it. And they love it. Deadly Dowagers is a game where you are going to be taking on the role of an uh, 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 um, aristocratic woman, uh, you know, a Victorian age, Victorian woman who's trying to up her level of status uh, by marrying husbands, getting a dowry for that, and then eventually killing their husbands and progressing up the social chain to a better husband as you work your way up to the Duke. And uh, it's a very, very funny game where you are uh, drafting cards, you're, you're passing cards off to your opponents, uh, either getting uh, different types of estates that are going to increase your values with your current husbands or looking for murder uh, tools, so you have guns, pistols, knives, uh, poison, or choking. You have different types of ways that you can murder your husband. And it's all in a kind of a playful way. I, you know, it kind of sounds kind of, you know, dark, but it's playful. And then you're, you're, you're moving up from your husband, which is going to be, you know, a basic worker to a professor, to uh, a landlord, to eventually the Duke, as you're all trying to get there. But the thing is, is, you know, the more elaborate deaths they have uh, will come with infamy. And that is a penalty, and you can't have too much infamy, otherwise the Duke's not going to marry you. So this is a fun little game. We have a lot of good times with this one. Um, my wife's always, like, laughing, hearing us talking about it. Uh, like, when we're playing the game, all the guys are in here shouting about who we're marrying and whatnot. It's a pretty funny game. And uh, I like the drafting mechanic, too, because it allows you to kind of get an idea. Drafting is always fun. Being able to pick cards and pass it to your opponents and kind of build your hand each round is always fun. And knowing that uh, you can't pass certain cards because they're too good or, or whatever. So, yeah, Deadly Dowagers by Tabletop Tycoon is coming in at number eight. Number seven, and this one's a little sad that it's fallen to seven for me. Let's do this. Is Maxim Apocalypse. This is the Wasteland, uh, uh, Wasted Wilds box. Um, this one is uh, one of my favorite solo games that I found recently. Uh, I was playing this with my wife. We were kind of going through a campaign together. Uh, but getting her to commit to a campaign game is impossible sometimes. So I decided to just go on my own, play some scenarios, uh, figure out different types of decks and, and different types of uh, uh, combinations of uh, scenarios that we can kind of come up with. And I have a lot of fun with this. The reason this hasn't been, and I made a video about this, is as to why this is like becoming my new favorite solo game. Um, the reason why this has kind of fallen though is later in the video you're going to see games that kind of overlapping with this. And I've been just gravitating to those, those more, but not taking away from Maximum Apocalypse. This game has been very, very good with uh, the way it works. So the idea of this game is you're going to have a survivor uh, who has their own unique deck, and you're going to pick one of the types of modules you want to go against. Uh, so they have like zombies, you have aliens, you have monsters, beasts, vampires, whatever you want to do. And then you're going to lay out a tile uh, track based on the scenario that you're going to play. And then you're going to move around and you're going to flip these tiles over, uh, which are going to be different types of uh, locations in the city that you are in. So you could have a flooded river or a police station or grocery store. And it allows you to also loot those locations. And sometimes they're going to spawn monsters that you're going to have to deal with using your cards. So it's a good little card game. It's a really fun, little engaging game. I really, really enjoy it. I recommend you checking out my video about this one specifically if you're interested in seeing more about it. I did have a 10% off coupon. I don't know if it's still available uh, for this one, but it's worth checking out if you're interested in seeing more about Maximum Apocalypse. Next, we have Detective City of Angels, and this is from Van Ryder Games. I've talked a little bit about Detective in the past, uh, but we finally got the newest expansion that was a game found um, they had a game found uh, release for this. And I very, very much love Detective in the way this game is allowing me to uh, bring players into the space that are not big board gamers, but it gives them the chance to relive some of those detective uh, murder mystery like experiences. Detective is a game where you're going to have one player, and this is the way I play it, by the way who will be the chisel, who's kind of like the storyteller, who takes on the roles of all the NPC-like characters, and the other players are gonna be the detectives as they move around the LA uh, city, 
uh, looking for clues, interviewing suspects. And when they interview a suspect, you're going to have the chisel is going to be the person being interviewed. And we have set types of uh, responses we can do. So if someone wants to ask this character about this character in my book, <coughs> I have responses that I can do to respond back to that person. So then I can choose to respond truthfully or kind of uh, wishy-washy or flat out lie. And then the person will have to decide if I'm telling the truth or if they want to pressure for more information. If they do pressure me for more information, I end up telling the truth, I actually will have leverage over them now. And the next time they want to ask me a question, I can use that leverage to block them from answering that, the asking that question, which effectively, you know, skips their turn. It's a really fun game. There is a cooperative mode where the game will handle the question asking portion. I've never played that. Uh, I know I have several people in the group who want to try that because they want to play with me instead of like against me. Um, yeah, so maybe soon we'll try it, but I enjoy the stories. They're pretty good. Uh, some people have said that they're a little bit cliche because they're like, oh, I was able to guess this one pretty quickly. But I find that I disagree with that personally. Uh, yes, sometimes you might get something that might lead you quicker to a response, but other people in the same scenario are completely on a different track because they didn't see the clues that you got. So again, I think it's good. Um, I recommend trying it out. There's a bunch of different types of versions of this game with different uh, modules that you can check out. So yeah, Detective City of Angels. Next, now this one's number five, not because of the quality of the game. That's Oathsworn, um, Journeys in the Deep Wood. Now this is uh, Into the Deep Wood. Um, I was mixing with the, the Lord of the Rings game. This game, we finally finished the campaign and I'm so happy we finally finished it. This was a long, uh, long task of playing this campaign and it became long because Oathsworn is divided into two portions of a single scenario. There are 21 scenarios inside Oathsworn. By, by the way, Oathsworn is a campaign based game, a grim dark uh, boss battling game where you're going to be hunting down monsters where you're trying to uh, uncover clues about what monster you're going to be fighting before you get there. And then you're going to actually delve into a boss battler, uh, which is, you know, the core of the game. So, 21 scenarios. Uh, each scenario is broken into two parts. You've got the story portion, and then you have the actual combat portion. The story portion uh, generally uh, begins with, you know, a narration. There's a nap, uh, a nap, an app narrator that can kind of read you through it. And then you're going to have choices that you're going to make, kind of a choose your own adventure, which is going to give you different types of rewards or take away uh, tokens from you, you from you for the battle. It's different ways to experience the story, but mostly it's always going to uh, alleviate and return back to the original battle. So there's not really a, too much changing of the narrative. It's just more of how would you approach it each time. Now, as we played, each of the scenarios, each half was getting exponentially more time consuming. So you'd see like the story portion taking two hours and then sometimes the battle phase taking two hours, sometimes three hours. And so we ended up having to uh, split our game night sessions into two sessions. So one, like one session, a uh, one scenario would take two plays. You, we do the first play together, just doing the story session and getting all the way up to the battle. And the next time we got together, we do the battle session. And that ended up just taking a lot longer. You're going from 21 weeks to 42 weeks to complete this game. Like that's a lot more time. So, and then we had holidays and family and people coming over. So obviously we weren't able to always meet up every week. And so this game took me about a year to complete, which was was daunting. It took a long time. In fact, the final the final five sessions, uh, we decided to just you know. We're going to spend five hours each play night and we're just going to get through each story and play session in a go because it was just taking too long and I was like, we need to get through this. But I'm glad I did because Oathsworn was rewarding. The combat is rewarding. I like the way that the game implements a system for you to um, come into the game with a different character if you want to switch it up without having too much of a repercussions for that. So I was able to play, uh, I think, five or six Characters, I think five. I played five different unique characters through my PlayStation of this. I played the Penitent, I played the Blade, I played the Witch. Um, maybe it was four. And I played the Grove Maiden. Um, I think it was four. I think I played four characters. But I pretty much was consistently playing either the Penitent, the Witch, or the Blade. Those were my my main characters throughout the, the throughout the game. 
But yeah, overall, it was a very, very good experience. Now, this will probably fall off this list. You probably won't see this on the list for a while because being a campaign game, uh, the, I'm not going to be going back to Oathsworn for many years uh, until I want to go back and play me with someone else. Uh, maybe just do a few maybe drop-in scenarios, which is an option where I want to try a different type of character. But for now, Oathsworn is completed and it's uh, taking its mantle on the shelf. And uh, But I want to talk about it because this took up a lot of my time in the last six months as we were wrapping up the, the story of it. So there we go, that's uh, Oathsworn. I'm gonna put it down here because the box is so big. Okay, coming in at number four, I've got Clash of Cultures this is the Monumental Edition by WizKids. So this is the, um, the remastered version that kind of came out in 2021, I believe. Uh, maybe 2022, 2021, that era, which basically took Clash of Cultures, which is a 2012, 2020, a 2012 uh, game, and also took its expansion and kind of put it all into a refined, redone version with refined rules. And I think this is a great game. I have been hunting, as I talk about all the time on this channel, looking for the civilization game that uh, is going to be the one that gives me the essence and feeling that I have a, a, a newly found civilization and we're expanding through technology or through area control, through military prowess. And Clash of Cultures is the first one that really gives me that Age of Empires feel that I'm trying to get from the video games. And so basically in this game, there are a bunch of different types of civilizations and you are gonna choose them and then you have a tech board that is you know available to you and you're also if you're playing with the leaders expansion you're going to have a, a an additional tech board that's going to be just your tech so if you're playing japan you're going to have japanese uh, themed text so pottery or whatever i can't remember what each one has like rome has uh better roads um the vikings have better boats you know, you have that additional technology. And then you're gonna be able to have uh, some starting technologies as well. But then from there, it's pretty much asymmetrical for everyone else because you're gonna be doing different types of technologies, which is gonna unlock different types of structures that you can build, which give you different types of abilities and powers. Uh, there's different types of units that you're gonna uh, train. And so this game really gives me that feeling of the asymmetrical civilization, Age of Empires-like experience. Some people have complained about the length of the game. I would say give it about two and a half hours, uh, two, three hours for a three or four player game. That's generally what we play. I really like the way the four player game plays. Um, but yeah, we finish in about two and a half to three hours. So yeah, that's Clash of Cultures. This one I put on at number three because of my experiences that I had at Dice Tower West. So it kind of lowered it, but this is one of my favorite games of all time. And uh, we're still playing it. We're playing it on Saturday this week, actually. And that's Blow on the Clock Tower. This is the social deduction game uh, that I have fallen in love with and has uh, captured my heart for the past year. Still playing it regularly. We played it, I played it down at Dice Tower West several times. I played it again since I've come back. We're playing it again uh, this at my house on Saturday. And in fact, uh, I just went and made uh, the scripts that we're gonna be playing. So these are the custom scripts that we, I printed off. Uh, these are from the No Rolls Barred, um, their own Clock Tower game. I basically just printed off their PDF sheets and I uh, laminate them and get them all ready for our game nights. So that's, and I, and I thought about doing a video, like just like a vlog of let's go get the custom scripts. Uh, we also have some custom tokens that we're making that my wife's making for me that are pretty sweet. But yeah, we're getting ready. Clock Tower, if you don't know, is a social deduction game where a player is going to draw a token out of a bag. It's gonna have one of these icons on it, which is gonna define your role in the game. One player is going to be the demon, and the goal of the good team, the blue players, is to execute and uh, remove the demon from the game. Well, the demon is going to try to uh, eliminate all of the players in the game, and eventually just being two players left alive, the evil team will win. That is the core of the game. I have fallen in love with this game and I think it's because of my magic background uh, with the ability of looking at combinations and how things interact with each other. And this game has a lot of interactions, nuances, things that uh, you can see different lines of play with how they're done. And I think it gives a really good rewarding aspect to people who want to take the time to uh, really uh, think about the game. If you are interested in Blood on the Clock Tower, I highly, highly recommend watching the No Rolls Barred in-person uh, videos. They're about two hours long on average, 
and it gives you a really good feeling of how this game is played in person. Uh, yes, they are rowdy, they're, they're joking, it's, it's definitely a show, uh, but for the most part, you get a really good idea of how the game's intended to be played, seeing people bluffing, seeing people trying to solve uh, the riddle, uh, the puzzle that's being developed, because really, this is a puzzle that's being that needs to be solved by the good team. You're gonna have your abilities that are providing things, you're gonna have evil teams who are going to be trying to mess up with your abilities, and it gives a really good uh, element to the game. I've never played a game that has captured me as much as this one, as it has, and I'm, I'm always gonna be shouting it up from the rooftops because I think it's a game that if most people tried it, I think they would love it, but it is intimidating, it is, it is especially when you're seeing all this, especially for the first time, you're like, oh my God. And I know even when I played it for the first time, you're, it's just a lot of information to take in, but uh, if you give it some time, I think anyone would really enjoy it, and eventually it all just kind of flows together and makes sense. So that's Blood on the Clock Tower. Okay, we're finally up to the final two. The final two are gonna make more sense about the Wasted Wilds that I was talking about here, the Maximum Apocalypse. And again, these are ones that I don't have boxes for. Um, so, here. so we're gonna do just this. So this one is the game that I've been playing, and this is my Rogue deck for Marvel Champions. I, I always show something different when I'm talking about Marvel Champions, but here's my Rogue deck. We've been playing a lot of Marvel Champions lately, and I think it's because I have uh, fallen in love with the X-Men animated series. If you guys don't know, the X-Men 97 has released on um, Disney Plus. And me and my wife watched it, and I was like, this is freaking incredible. So now we're going back and we're watching, re-watching all of the original animated series uh, from like 92 to 96. Uh, so we're watching that right now. And that just revitalized me to go back and be like, God, I want to play more Marvel Champions. I want to play my favorite characters. You know, Rogue is one of my favorite characters. So we're playing that right now. Uh, me and my friend Matt, uh, we're moving through the campaign. He's playing Gambit. I've talked about that before. And so we are getting close to um, finishing that campaign. And I believe we're going to have Age of Apocalypse is coming up next. If it hasn't released already. So I want to make sure I'm picking that up. Uh, I feel like the X-Men characters for Marvel Champions has elevated Marvel Champions from a, a system that, in my opinion, is already top tier to just another top tier. Just because I think the X-Men characters have a little bit more life to them. They're a little bit more real. So that's me. Yeah. So Marvel Champions. Really, really love this game. But because I've been playing this game more, it takes away from other card-based games um, in general. So that's, that's one of the drawbacks, unfortunately. Uh, when you have games that have somewhat similar overlap like that. So yeah, this is my system that I have for some of my cards. You can see here, I printed off um, here. So you can see here, I've got a rogue uh, front deck, which then the rogue behind it. And then here, like we have Gambit. So in the Gambit deck behind it. Then here we have Exodus, which is one of the modules for that game. So that's kind of an idea of how I uh, uh, organize and do my Marvel Champions. And again, I've talked about these types of boxes. These are the Game Genic uh, boxes. I have a bunch of Game Genic boxes. I've talked about them in my accessories videos, uh, how much I love them. They're great. Not that one's not the best, but I do really, really love the Game Genic boxes. And the final one, another Game Genic box, but this is one that was a Kickstarter. This was the Talarian Academy deck box. The final game that I've been obsessed with, really obsessed with, which has kind of impacted my channel a little bit, has been Star Wars Unlimited. So this is the Star Wars Unlimited deck that I've been playing uh, recently. Uh, I, I just really, really fell in love with this game. Star Wars Unlimited is a um, trading card game released by Fantasy Flight using obviously the Star Wars IP. And it allows players to play a bunch of different types of Star Wars games and our, our Star Wars cards uh, in, a, in a really fleshed out, in, interesting universe and have a good time with it. I, I really do love this game. Uh, what's unique about this game comparatively to other games, I have here uh, a, a leader card and a base card. These are kind of what dictate the type of cards you're gonna be building in your deck. So your leader has two colors up here. So this is Aiden Verso, she's blue and black. Black stands for villainy. Uh, you could think of empire, but there's more villainous characters. They're not just, don't just belong to the empire. So black just means villainy. Uh, the good characters are heroic, so they're white. And then you're gonna pick a base, so this is a green base. So my colors for this deck are blue, black, and green. So then when you're building your deck, you're choosing cards that are also green, 
or blue black, blue black. So it kind of dictates the kind of um, deck you're going to eventually construct. And then you will go to, I normally go to my local game store. This isn't a game that I play on the tabletop with my friends, although I'm not opposed to doing that. My, you know, you have to have people who want to play with you. Uh, so I find the best way to play this game is to go to a local game store and <clears throat> play against other people on the, you know, the local night. So every week, so here we have either Tuesdays or Fridays uh, that people meet up and play. Uh, so you just sign up and go and play those. And then you get some packs if you do well or, you know, you just play for fun, whatever you want to do. So yeah, that's uh, Star Wars Unlimited. That's number one. That's been the game that has captured my heart. I've really, I've talked about that. I love the game. Um, in fact, Fantasy Flight has said that it's their, their most successful game ever. And in the first two or three months now, two and a half months that the game's been released, they've sold more product than they did in the entire first year that Destiny uh, did for its first full year of production. So that's a great thing for uh, Fantasy Flight that they're seeing such good numbers. It's a shame that they underprinted for the demand, but they're going to have to learn that. They're like, okay, obviously, we, you know, we sold out in two months. Uh, we need to make sure our next set is a higher demand. They don't want to be what happened with Lorcana with uh, Ravensburger, who had nowhere near enough supply to meet up with the demand, and it negatively impacted the game because for months, people couldn't get product, and if you can't get product, people can't play your game. So Fantasy Flight's definitely uh, a little bit more versed in it than Ravensburger when it comes to the trading card ver uh, games, uh, but even here, they sold out within two months. So that's going to wrap up the games that I've been playing that I love. But I still have more games I want to talk about. We're going to talk about three games that are going to be hopefully on next time's list, if they're good. These are the games I'm most excited about playing uh, coming up. So the first one is going to be Dune. This is the War of the Rackus version. Um, this game looks so stinking good. This is a War of the Ring, Rebellion-like game designed by the same guys who made those. And gives players the chance to play as either the Harkonnen or the uh, Atreides. I, I forgot the name. The Atreides. Either the Harkonnen or the Atreides as you fight for Dune. This has a lot of elements of the movie. If you've seen the movie where you see a lot more characters um, that you might not know about. Also, or obviously the book. If you read the book, the book's uh, a little bit more dense. So not too many people have read the book. But uh, definitely, definitely excited about playing this one. Now, the only drawback is it's a two-player game, which is going to limit the uh, people that I can play this with. Because, you know, when you have your game nights, normally we have at minimum three players show up. So being able to play a two-player game kind of limits that. Now, there is a four-player option, but the four-player option does not look as good as you expect. Like, I just don't think it's worth playing. Yeah, this is one I'm definitely looking forward to playing, and hopefully, come six months from now, we'll be talking about how great Dune is. The next one, I don't have it with me yet, um, right now, uh, but that'll be Euthia. We've, I, we played Euthia last night for the first time, uh, just kind of like a tutorial. It's funny, we, we played the one hour scenario, and I think my friend was here for five hours as we were going through the rule book, organizing the thing, playing it, then we restarted, played it again, uh, so yeah, his wife was like, oh yeah, we're gonna we're only gonna be playing the one hour scenario. He came over at 5 p.m., left at midnight, you know, whatever. But that's that's work, you know. And my, my other friends were asking what I was doing. I'm like, well, just working, working on Euthia. But yeah, I'm hoping that Euthia is gonna be a really interesting game. I'm curious to see how it's gonna do overall. It uh, has some elements of like kind of like a Diablo-like game where you're just kind of ro uh, roaming the land, exploring, fighting monsters, leveling up, getting gear. So we'll see what it's like. Uh, the only thing that kind of makes me a little nervous at, on the first initial playthrough is, is it going to be as exciting to constantly do the same thing? Because it's it's not a campaign game from what I can tell. Maybe there is one. Uh, but from what I can see, it's scenario based. So you're going to be starting at level one every time you start a scenario and going from there. But I'll, I'll find out more as we dive in. We just played the first scenario for right now. The final game I want to play was one that I was super hyped for. Finally got it all in. Finally got it all organized. And that is Six Siege, the board game. Uh, this is from Mythic Games. Uh, I obviously paid the, uh, got a dink up here, unfortunately, paid their ransom, but it finally showed up and it looks really, really good. I'm super excited to see what's going to be in this one. I'm hoping to get it to the table here uh, shortly. Um, it's a combat uh, tactical uh, combat game where one team is going to be defending uh, an objective. The other team is going to be trying to infiltrate and uh, neutralize the targets or 
uh, capture the objective. Super, super excited. I, I'm a big fan of Rainbow Six. I've been playing Rainbow Six video games since like 97, 98, when the first one came out on PC. And uh, I've been playing them since then. Still play this one, in fact. So, uh, yeah, super excited. So that's it. We're going to wrap up the video. But first off, we're going to remind you guys about the Mythic Mischief, the Fractured Sky, and the uh, Moonrakers giveaway that we've got going on now. So as I mentioned earlier, we've got the giveaway going for these three games. Uh, if you can, we, so funny enough, I was having you guys do hashtags. Hashtags are easy because I'm able to track them uh, for the giveaway so that I can make sure I can track people who have entered the giveaway and whatnot. Uh, but YouTube censors the, the hashtag. So I need to figure out um, how I'm gonna do it. We're gonna do it this one more video. We're gonna see if I can make it so it doesn't censor them for this video. But yeah, it censors them and then I have to go through and approve all the comments. So at one time we had one of my friends was like, man, you got no comments on your video. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of weird. And I realized it's because YouTube had blocked 69 of them. So I had to go through and approve them and now I'm consistently having to check and make sure uh, people's comments are getting approved so that they can be entered into the giveaway. So for today's giveaway, we're gonna do hashtag, uh, what do we wanna do? What would be a fun one? Let's do hashtag unlimited, just like Star Wars Unlimited. And I wanna know what are the best games that you guys have been playing within like the last six months. Just think back into your time and think, what have been the most exciting games or most fun games that you've been playing in the last six months? I want to see them in the comment section down below. Maybe there's be some games that I haven't seen or I want, you know, I want to know more about, and uh, we'll go from there. Also, we have another news. We're, as I said, we've got these three games that I'm gonna be giving away. I reached out to IV Studios and I said, hey guys, I want to know if there's anything else we can give away. And they actually said, yes, we can help you out, Brian. So they are going to also help me here, and they're gonna give away because we're doing, they're doing a reprint campaign for Fractured Sky. They said they would give me an additional uh, all-in pledge, super deluxe version of Fractured Sky to give away uh, in combination with our 10,000 subscriber bonus that we're going for. And uh, the only thing with that one is whoever wins that one, you're gonna have to put $1 into the pledge manager for um, Fractured Sky. So, cause they're going to then add the credits to your pledge manager. So that'll be the only thing different with that one. So all of these don't require purchase, obviously. That one will require at least a $1 pledge. We can talk about that with whoever wins it if they wanna do that or not. Uh, but yeah, super excited for them to be offering an additional pledge for us. That's super cool. Remember to be entered into the giveaways. You have to be subscribed to the channel, leave a comment with the uh, unlimited hashtag in there as well as you know give me comments and then smash that like button and if you really want to be super cool share the video with a friend let me know what you guys think i will talk to you very soon bye bye <laughs>